All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us here on this Friday. Um, so we're going to do um, a little one hour CE lecture for you guys on the neurological exam uh, and specifically trying to achieve um, a lesion localization, which is one of our big purposes of uh, doing the exam. So um, just to get us started, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Blake Webb. Um, I'm one of the newer doctors to start at Southeast Veterinary Neurology. Um, originally from Alabama, uh, did my undergrad at Auburn University, uh, pursued veterinary school at Ross University in the Caribbean, uh, went back to Auburn to finish a clinical year of training, um, decided I wanted to specialize and discovered my um, interest for neurology in that clinical year. So um, did a year long rotating internship at Mississippi State's vet school and then um, was lucky and matched straight into my residency for neurology and neurosurgery at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, went through a few winters there and decided that um, warmer weather was uh, for me. So joined the team down here in Southeast Florida and I've really enjoyed it since. So um, wanted to give you guys this lecture. Um, Hope everyone is staying safe out there. The last time I gave this lecture was in the uh, Marriott Hotel in a conference center. It's nice to have everyone and have dinner, but um, you know, during the, this time and age, we'll um, you know, do these online for now. So a couple of other little housekeeping things. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end, but know that you can send in your questions throughout the, the lecture. Um, so just type those in. We'll flag some ones um, that, we think are, uh, that we like or that we think are important questions, and I'll go over them for about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation. Um, if I can't get to your question, we will try to email you um, a response um, at the end of, of everything. It might take us a couple of days to get through them, but we'll email you back. A um, couple of other housekeeping things we have here. So um, the big Synapse Conference. So every year, uh, Southeast Vet Neuro puts on a uh, conference pertaining to all kinds of neurological and physical rehabilitation um, topics um, for CE credit. Um, we are going to move that to virtual this year, again, given um, kind of all the things going on with COVID-19 right now and uh, need for precautions. So that will all be online um, and everyone should be getting an invitation in their email in the next couple of weeks um, if they want to register for that. Um, last little thing we have here is, um, so this is um, race approved for CE for one hour, but know that you'll get your certificate for that CE about an hour after this um, presentation ends. So um, don't panic and it will come uh, shortly um, after everything is done. All right, so um, if everyone's good, we'll go ahead and get started um, and start talking about the neurological exam. So the neurological exam um, is basically broken down into six sections. So when you're evaluating your patient, you want to uh, check sensorium or mentation. So kind of what is the mental status of this patient and what is their alertness level? Um, next step is you want to evaluate their cranial nerve. So just like in people, dogs and cats have 12 cranial nerves that come from the brain and innervate um, sensation, motor function to the face, the eyes, the uh, larynx, pharynx, tongue, you name it. Um, so we want to evaluate those. We also want to check postural reactions or paw placements, and there's some other tests that we can do to kind of test that, but a sense of, you know, do, does this patient know where their limbs are in space or not? Uh, next is gait and posture. So um, some of the, you know, diseases that we deal with, with like disc herniations, we want to know if these patients are ambulatory or non-ambulatory, um, and what does that gait look like if they are able to walk? Last couple of things is spinal reflexes. So we want to check the reflexes in all four limbs and also um, the cutaneous trunchi and perineal. Um, make sure that those are normal because those can localize um, diseases to the spinal cord. And finally, we want to assess pain. So is this patient experiencing discomfort so that we know how to better control that or at least add in pain meds and also um, you want to test for pain perception. So um, if this animal has some sort of a spinal cord lesion, can they feel their toes anymore? Because that will definitely change prognosis. 
Um, the next little section that we'll go through in this talk is we will kind of talk about the functional and anatomical regions of both the brain and the spinal cord, as well as the peripheral nervous system, a little more minimally. Um, but essentially, what types of signs of dysfunction can we see if there's uh, certain parts of the brain affected, certain parts of the spinal cord affected? And that'll help us achieve that localization. Um, at the end, we'll also go over some special syndromes. So some things that you can see that look very strange or weird, but can help you um, pinpoint a lesion. And so um, helpful to kind of have in your back pocket as you're evaluating patients. All right, so talking a little bit about the neurological exam, we've kind of touched on this before, but there's two big goals that we really are trying to accomplish when we do a neurological exam. Um, the first one is, is the problem you know, that this owner is seeing at home or that the patient's exhibiting signs of, is it neurologic in origin, yes or no? Um, because there can be uh, metabolic diseases, there can even be orthopedic diseases that look neurologic. So performing the neuro exam can kind of help rule in or rule out some other um, uh, body systems that could be affected. Um, after you do the neuro exam and you assess like, hey, yes, this is a neurological problem, the next thing you want to say is, okay, well, where in the nervous system can I pinpoint this problem? Um, is it somewhere in the brain, somewhere in the spinal cord, or is it in the peripheral nervous system? Um, so specifically an individual nerve at the nerve muscle junction or the neuromuscular junction, or is it a primary muscle problem? Um, and we don't get into peripheral nervous system as much as kind of in its own world, but we will uh, touch on it briefly and kind of show some of the signs that you will see. And what's important about pinpointing, you know, what is the problem and where is the problem? You know, if you add this in with a signalment of a patient, so their history, their age and their breed um, and the gender, you can better differentiate what potential causes um, are there for this patient. So, you know, like older patients, you would assume potentials for cancerous processes, younger patients, maybe more congenital or, or malformation type processes, um, but you'll um, be able to kind of better differentiate if you know where in the nervous system the dysfunction is coming from. Um, so a lot of people are afraid to do the neurological exam, but um, you don't need any special equipment to do the neuro exam. You don't have to have an MRI or anything like that. So to do a neuro exam, some of the good equipment that you'll need is uh, a flexor hammer, so something to kind of elicit um, your spinal reflexes, um, a bright light to check for your um, pupillary light responses that will go over, um, some hemostats. Uh, sometimes we have to be um, uh, provide a little bit of a sharper stimulus so sometimes hemostats um, are better at doing that than our fingertips and then as more often than not a lot of times when we have patients with neurological disease they can have difficulty standing difficulty walking so trying to have a nice non-slippery surface to evaluate them on um, can be helpful but all these are pretty simple things that you can have um, available for you all right, so now that we've gone through those things, let's kind of jump into the neurological exam. So um, what are the exact steps and what are we looking for? So the first big category we talked about is what is the mentation of this patient's, um, otherwise known as, uh, as the sensorium. So what is their mentation status and what is their alertness? And it's really easy to best kind of do this with gathering history from the owner, but also just watching the patient in the room. So are they kind of standing in a corner by themselves um, or are they wagging their tail looking at you looking at the nurses coming in and out of the room you know how alert and responsive are they so some of the levels that you can see and you can put into your records as you're evaluating patients is you know patients can be quiet alert and responsive or bright alert and responsive so that's the uh, little acronyms qar to bar there um, so those would all be kind of considered normal so the ones that we would get to that are abnormal, so the first step would be a patient that is obtunded. A lot of times uh, you'll see that written as dull or, you know, just not as alert as you would expect it to be. You can see patients like that be mild, moderate, or severe in how obtunded they are. The next step down is a patient that is stuporous. So generally, these are patients that are not standing on their own. They're more likely laying on their side. And these patients only respond to a noxious stimulus, so kind of like a sharp pain sensation stimulus. And that's where your hemostats come into play. If you have a patient that's not rousable, not giving you um, the proper mental cues, using hemostats to pinch along skin or toes, 
to see if you can stimulate them to be more alert. And the last level and, and, and worst level as far as mentation goes is when a patient has become comatose. So that is when a patient doesn't even respond to the noxious stimulus. So you can pinch on a toe or webbing of skin and they're still not giving you any um, action or looking around or trying to raise their head, trying to move away from you. Um, so they kind of um, have reached the, the, the worst level of mentation loss. Um, when we talk about mentation or sensorium, it's important to consider both what we call prosencephalic or forebrain uh, lesions, but also brain stem lesions, so the kind of more uh, back part of our brain, depending on how severe it is. Generally, with brain stem lesions, that's going to be your more severe changes, so um, patients that are stuporous or comatose, and that is because there is the ARAS sense, uh, system, the ascending reticular activating system that promotes your alertness level and that travels within the brainstem. So when you get lesions there, you typically get uh, more severe changes in your mentation. So here we have some pictures of uh, some patients that you could encounter and try to say, you know, what do we think that their um, alertness level is? So we have a very happy golden here, um, definitely bright, alert, responsive. Um, you have uh, a little chihuahua here, long-haired chihuahua, so um, not bouncing around or barking or, you know, kind of doing normal things, So, uh, but does seem to be alert here, so maybe more of a quiet, alert, responsive type of example. Um, here we have a great hound, so you can kind of tell this guy's a bit off, his head's low. He's not necessarily, you know, recumbent or laying on his side, but he's definitely not wagging his tail and, and showing interest that someone's standing next to him taking a picture. So this would be more of, a, of an example of being obtunded. Um, uh, and then when you get to worsening mentations like stuporous or comatose, you get patients that are laying on their side and not responsive. I thought this was a good example of a, of a food coma in a little puppy. <laughs> All right, so once you've worked through what you think the mentation of a, of a patient is, we'll start working through the cranial nerves, and this is generally a, a part of the exam that takes a little bit of time and also the most getting used to of, of what are we testing and, and um, you know, what uh, are appropriate responses. Um, so before we go through all of this, um, you know, uh, kind of limited in how long of videos that we can show on this platform. So do know that there are lots of videos on YouTube that show a full neurological exam from start to finish. So I would encourage you to kind of watch those and see the the technical skill of how to do it. Um, the focus of this talk will kind of stick with, you know, how are we testing it and what would be abnormal, and then you know, knowing that that is where the problem is, like which cranial nerve is the problem. So getting started here on the cranial nerves, um, the first one that we have is the olfactory nerve. Um, so cranial nerve one. So if we um, have dysfunction of our olfactory nerve, we've uh, essentially lost our sense of smell. And um, the clinical term for that is anosmia. So we don't usually test for this clinically. It's not something that most owners are bringing a patient in um, for us to look at. Sometimes um, it is. So generally what you would want to do to test that is hide some food underneath some things, uh, try to you know test them to see if they can sniff this out without it being uh, visually in front of them. Um, we don't use um, caustic chemicals. They used to use like alcohol on cotton balls. Um, that can actually stimulate different cranial nerves. And so it's not a good uh, use for um, trying to uh, test your sense of smell. The next one we have is our cranial nerve two or our optic nerve. So this is the nerve that's um, responsible for vision. So the way that we'll test this is with menace. So testing cranial nerves two and seven, you'll cover one eye and bring uh, your hand towards the other eye and you should see that patient flinch or blink that eye completely closed um, and know that they're visual and seeing your hand coming at them. The other test we'll do is what's called a PLR or a pupillary light response. And so the purpose of that is you will shine a, a bright light into the eye and you should see that pupil contract down and you should see the other pupil also contract called a consensual. So you have your direct contraction and your consensual attraction. And you want to test both eyes and make sure you get that in both eyes. Lastly, sometimes, especially with cats, they don't want to menace for us very well. Cats can be in a category all of their own when it comes to neuro exams in general, um, but sometimes tracking with cotton balls. So taking cotton balls and throwing them around the room 
in front of the patient and watching to see if they're tracking it as it lands, because uh, generally it's pretty quiet and they're not gonna just be listening. Um, so that would be the big ways that we're testing that. There's multiple potential areas of dysfunction if you have a patient that's not visual. So over here on the side, we can see a diagram. So you always have to make sure to take a good look at the eyes, because obviously your retinal detachment, uveitis, cataracts, bad glaucoma, things like that can cause ocular disease that could cause a patient to be not visual. So make sure you rule that out before you definitively diagnose neurologic problems. But you can have problems along the optic nerve here. You can have problems within the optic chiasm. The, uh, the vision pathway does decussate, meaning it crosses over. So when you're testing vision in your left eye, uh, the right forebrain is what's processing that information. So back here in the occipital lobe, if you have a problem um, within that part of the forebrain, you can see vision changes on the opposite eye. The next nerves that we'll kind of group together is cranial nerves three, which is your oculomotor, cranial nerve four, which is your trochlear, and cranial nerve six, which is your abducens. So these cranial nerves are are important for eye movement and also for eye um, position. So what we will do to try and test these is we will um, look for physiologic nystagmus. So we'll take a patient, move their head from left to right, and you should see the fast twitches of their eye following the horizon. And when you've come to all the way to the other side, their eyes should stay put. There shouldn't be additional eye movements. If there is, that is pathologic nystagmus, so that's abnormal. And then as always, we wanna just get a good look straight into their face and make sure that these patients have symmetrical eyes, make sure one eye is not deviated laterally, medially, or even tilted and kind of rotated. Um, the quick way for those of you that really enjoy neurology and want to kind of remember which of these uh, cranial nerves do which, so this little acronym SO4LR6 AO3 is a helpful acronym that I used and still use um, daily. So the superior oblique muscle is innervated by the trochlear nerve, or cranial nerve four. So the superior oblique is right here. When you get dysfunction of the trochlear nerve, you can kind of see these outward rotations of the top parts of the eye. Obviously a lot easier to see in cats because they have um, the more slitted eyes, more rounded eyes like dogs, it can be hard to see. Next one is the lateral rectus is innervated by cranial nerve six or the abducens. So that's the um, muscle that's sitting along the lateral part of the eye. So if you get dysfunction of this lateral muscle that's pulling your eye laterally, you're gonna see the eye move medially. And that's um, what's shown here in um, uh, figure C. And then, all other muscles are innervated by three, so A of three. And so you'll generally see more of a lateral deviation for those patients. All right, next one we have here is cranial nerve five, otherwise known as the trigeminal nerve. So we will test this by corneal reflex facial sensation. So um, touching along the face, along the maxilla and mandibular regions, um, you'll see the dogs kind of twitch and they don't like your face being touched. So you're testing that sensory component. Um, cranial nerve five also has a motor component. So it goes to the muscles of mastication. So your masseter muscles and your temporalis muscles. So it's always it's nice to take a look and again just look for symmetry in a patient is there um, muscle loss on one side both sides sometimes for fluffier dogs it can be hard to see that externally so I always like to put my hands on those muscles and make sure they feel symmetrical and that I'm not feeling more of a pro prominent zygomatic arch on one side versus the other there's three big branches um, of the uh, of cranial nerve five. Um, you know, as neurologists, we want to know, you know, which ones we're testing. Which big ones to know is just that the ophthalmic um, is on the um, medial canthus when you're doing that palpebral reflex, and when you do a corneal reflex, you're touching the globe of the eye and watching that eye go back in. So you're specifically testing the ophthalmic branch of cranial nerve five there. And then you have both your mandibular and maxillary. So superior eyelid for maxillary and nasal mucosa with mandibular is mainly when you're touching along the muscles of the cheeks. 
So here are some examples of um, patients that can have uh, cranial nerve 5 dysfunction. So you can see our poor Beagle here. He's normal here on his left side, um, but he has definite loss of muscles of mastication on the right. You can see a pretty large dent where his temporalis muscle should be, and a dent here where his uh, masseter muscle should be. You can see more of this prominent zygomatic arch. So this is actually a patient um, that we saw not too long ago. So this patient has actually had uh, trigeminal neuritis, so an inflammation of both of those trigeminal nerves, and that actually causes a slap jaw. So if you go and push this patient's jaw completely shut, it falls right back open. So those masseter muscles of chewing are not functioning appropriately. They can't keep that uh, jaw closed. And so you do see a lot of foaming and, and um, drooling in these patients. Next, we have cranial nerve seven. So this is the facial nerve. Um, again, we're testing this with when we're doing that menace because it's what's actually closing that eye all the way down. It does actually do the sensation to the inner pinna. So when you're doing your facial sensation, make sure you get into the pinna there. And if the dog twitches his ear moves away, you know that that part of seven is working. But the more classic example of testing that is looking for facial symmetry. So here is a boxer here um, that on the left side, you can see he looks very droopy. Um, you can see the commissures of his lips are definitely lopsided. Um, there's a hand in the way here, but oftentimes you can see that ear has drooped down a bit. And again, some drooling is really common when they have that. Um, we should know that facial nerve seven um, uh, or cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve, does have some other important um, um, things that it innervates. So taste um, in the palate and the rostral two thirds of the tongue um, is responsible um, from cranial nerve seven. And it is also important for the innervation of some of your lacrimal and salivary glands. So when you get patients like this that have facial asymmetry, signs of cranial nerve seven or facial nerve paralysis, it's important to check your tear production in that eye because that that gland is no longer receiving innervation. They can get dry eye and be exposed to having ulcers. They also can't blink that eye shut anymore. So if they're hitting it or bumping into things, you can get bad ulcerations. So we wanna make sure that we protect those patients. Next here, we have cranial nerve eight, so called the vestibulocochlear nerve. So the big things that we do to test this nerve is we are looking for observation of the head and body position at rest. Um, you can watch them walk, and sometimes you'll see some ataxia or incoordination. We also want to check for nice stagmus for these patients. And then there's some more specific tests like bear tests if you're more worried about the auditory or hearing function portion of this nerve. Um, you can actually send electrical signals and get some waveforms to see if they can hear. So here we have a group of pubs that are uh, not neurologic, but very curious, um, but have that kind of classic head tilt. Um, so as we kind of talked about, there is the uh, cochlear root of this nerve, and that's more of the uh, sound and auditory hearing, you know, type portion for this nerve. And then you have the vestibular part of this nerve, and that transmits the impulses to the brain of where is my head in relation to gravity, and it helps you maintain a level head posture. And when you get that dysfunction, like we talked about, you can get those head tilts. These roots do go together to feed in information into the medulla or the back part of the brainstem. Um, and so if you have multiple areas um, of concern, multiple cranial nerves that are being um, affected, you'll start worrying about you know, this going to the brainstem. And we'll touch base on where these cranial nerves are feeding back into the brain in a little bit. Last little bit about the vestibular uh, cochlear nerve or, or cranial nerve eight is we do want to try to distinguish when we have vestibular patients um, using our neuro exam, do we think that this is central, meaning that that brainstem portion is um, being affected by a disease process, or do we think that this is peripheral? So meaning it's just the cranial nerve um, part, not the brain, and some of those inner ear structures that are being affected. So a um, nice little helpful chart here of what you would look for um, to try to distinguish, is this patient a central vestibular disease or is this patient peripheral? The big ones for central is any patient that has abnormal mentation, you worry about central because of where those um, ARAS system and those mentation um, centers live. 
Um, the other big ones, any patient that is tetraparetic, so truly weak, you worry about a central component. All of these patients can be head tilted one way or the other. Most of them can have some circling behavior. A lot of them has, can have in coordination, so not really helpful between central and peripheral. Um, last big couple of things is if you have a central patient, so a patient whose brainstem is being affected, causing vestibular signs, you can have paw placement deficits on the side of the lesion. So sometimes if the head tilt is to the left, you'll see paw placements on the left front and left fore. Any patient that has additional cranial nerves that are involved um, also worry about central because they will feed back to the brainstem and we'll go over that. Um, the last one is um, some patients with vertical nystagmus. So um, I, rapid eye movements that are going up and down tend to be more central. It's not exactly a 100% slam dunk, but is reported out there. Um, and lastly, if you have a patient that has Horner's, which is a special syndrome where we have um, disruption of the sympathetic innervation to the eye, um, you can um, feel a little more confident that that might be peripheral, and we'll go through that um, in the special syndrome section. So um, nystagmus, so for those that haven't seen nystagmus, know that it can go in a couple of different um, directions. So we talked about vertical. It can be horizontal, so more on the left and right. And when we do that, we wanna try to characterize what is the fast phase. So generally there's a slow deviation and then the eyes will snap back. So generally the eye is uh, going towards the side of the problem, going towards the side of the lesion, and then snapping back and being corrected quickly. Um, so you want to say fast phases to the right or fast phases to the left for those patients. I always kind of do it as like uh, if you're falling asleep at the wheel of a car, you're slowly kind of going off to the edge of the road, which is bad, and then you jerk back and get back onto the road, hopefully not overcorrecting, but um, that's kind of how I remember that they kind of drift towards the, the side of the problem. You can see some more weirder types of nystagmus, so rotary, pendulous. Um, there's some what we call disconjugate nystagmus where the eyes are moving in opposite directions of each other. We won't go through all of that, um, but I do have some um, uh, uh, examples here of some nystagmus. So this little patient, um, you can see some more what we call pendulous. So this, these eyes are going, kind of going back and forth. This wasn't the more um, you know, classical up, down, left, right. So moving on, um, last little thing we'll kind of touch on with vestibular disease. So again, if you have patients with head tilts showing signs of balance problems, sometimes you can see bilateral vestibular disease. So patients that have potentially ear infections in either ear, and they kind of um, have these very characteristic, very wide abnormal head excursions. And sometimes they'll wobble back and forth um, as an example in this little kitty cat here. So you can see him going back and forth um, and he actually had um, bilateral ear infections. I'll play that video for you again so you can kind of take a good look at that. All right, so we're gonna pick up the speed here a little bit and make it through the rest of um, uh, our exam. So cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11, and 12, we kind of group together because um, we kind of assess them at the same time. 9, 10, and some of 11 are um, important for um, swallowing um, and, and those kind of normal gag reflexes. So generally when we are testing those, we'll lower the jaw. If it's a sweet dog, you can do an internal gag. So inserting your finger towards the back of the larynx and getting them to elicit that gag response. Some patients are not uh, patients that you want to stick your fingers in. And especially if you have a patient where you're worried about rabies or something along those lines, don't stick your fingers um, down their mouth, but you can put gin pressure along the larynx and sometimes you can elicit a swallow externally and so those are things that you can look for there. Um, the um, accessory nerve, so cranial nerve 11 over here, um, does also innervate motor function to muscles of the neck so you can get atrophy of the neck muscles. Pretty rare to see that that nerve is in and of itself the only thing affected. Never personally seen a case of that. 
And lastly, looking to see that the dog can maintain tongue posture. So again, if they're panting or have their mouth open, you can kind of look, um, but making sure that the hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve 12, is innervating those muscles to the tongue appropriately. Um, and here's a good example of why you always want to look in the mouth. You can see that there's atrophy along the left side of the tongue of this patient. All right. So cranial nerves are big and extensive, um, a lot to go through. So we'll move on to um, postural reactions. So this is what a lot of um, practitioners are, are learning, as you know, paw placements or conscious proprioception and CPs uh, that we'll talk about. So you can do standing paw placements where you're supporting the animal's weight. You'll let them knuckle over and make sure that they can appropriately replace that leg. You can do hopping, so taking away the other three legs and making that patient hop on one leg left to right, making sure that they can um, do that in a coordinated fashion. There's also hemi walking and wheelbarrowing, which I don't do um, as commonly, but if you're not quite sure, like, is this paw placement real? Sometimes hopping and wheelbarrowing those patients make it more obvious and are worth doing. Extensor postural thrust is also a, exam, a test uh, easier done for the little guys because you pick them up and you kind of set them back on their rear end and you should watch their back legs scoot underneath them. They want to get those uh, legs underneath them again. So when we're talking about paw placements, um, what we need to remember is that lesions causing paw placement deficits can be anywhere from the nerves of that limb through the spinal cord, through the brain stem, and then this pathway actually crosses and goes to the other side of the forebrain. So um, assuming we're testing the back right leg here, you can have dysfunction along those nerves, you can have dysfunction through the spinal cord here, and then this pathway crosses over and it's perceived in the opposite hemisphere of the brain. So if you have a dog that's showing brain signs and it's localizing left and you have right-sided paw placements, you can kind of make that connection that there's a left forebrain problem. If you have a dog that's dragging both of its back legs and, and knuckling as it's doing that, you feel more confident that that's going to be down more into the spinal cord. Um, when you are evaluating a patient with um, vestibular disease or with forebrain disease, remember that the legs don't lie. Um, they're going to tell you generally where that disease process is. So if you have um, a dog that has a head tilt balance signs, where you're seeing the paw placement deficits is where the lesion is. Um, and if you have it with forebrain disease, just know that it's crossing over. So a couple of quick pictures of how um, to best test for paw placement reaction. So uh, most importantly, you want to make sure that these patients' weight is supported. You don't want them falling or fighting or flailing. So um, picture on the left here is um, a little bit more strenuous on your back, but if you have a big dog, especially if it's a dog that may be a little timid or shy, he, he's kind of showing teeth and you want to be careful, you basically can extend your arm uh, by the neck and go underneath, support the weight there, and then reach over and use your other arm to, to check your paw placements here. Um, and this is a good way to protect your face and, and, and uh, make sure that you're not going to get injured. Um, if you have a bad back, which I'm developing one, uh, the picture on the right is a little bit easier. So using your, your knee to kind of help support their chest and setting your hand there, that way your legs are kind of supporting their weight and you're not having to pick them up and then using your free hand there uh, to check paw placements. Um, again, for bigger dogs on the back, again, trying to take a knee and resting your hand on your knee there and using that to kind of support them underneath their belly um, to, to use your free hand to check paw placements is helpful and again takes some of the weight and puts it onto your legs and, and not your back. For these tiny little guys, they tend to be easier. Extending your arm through their legs, so kind of underneath their pelvis up to their chest, and supporting them basically just like on a board and flipping those paw placements or flipping the paws over and seeing if they're picking them up and replacing them appropriately. All right, next section here, gait and posture. So you want to evaluate, can these patients walk? So a lot of times owners come in, they're painful, you know, the dogs are being held. You do want to encourage the owner to, to put the dog down on the ground in a safe area and watch what they're doing. So when you're doing a gait assessment, you got two big questions that you wanna answer. So the first one, 
is the dog ambulatory or not? Because that can change, is this emergent or not? Um, and so by ambulatory, generally, I mean, can the dog take about 10 or so steps before um, it either falls over or lays down? If they're kind of on the cusp of like 10 or so steps, it's fair to, to call and say, hey, I have a dog that's weakly ambulatory, um, you know, kind of on that cusp, and we'll understand what that means. So if you say that a, a patient is, is ambulatory, um, or even if you're saying that it's not, you know, what are you seeing? Is it normal or abnormal? So, you know, sometimes you'll see a dog walk and it looks great, it's normal. So you'll say ambulatory, normal gait. Um, but sometimes you'll see a dog walk and you're like, this dog is definitely not normal. So when you say this dog is normal, you have to be specific and kind of break that down into four categories. So is the dog paretic, meaning it has a reduced motor function, so it can move these legs, it's just not moving it to the full degree that it should be, or is the dog plegic, so meaning this dog is paralyzed and cannot move a limb or several limbs. Um, so you can also use the terms para versus tetra, so this dog is para, paretic, meaning both back legs are weak and not moving appropriately. You can say this dog is tetra paretic all four legs are weak and not moving as well as they should for any patient that is plegic so you're you're evaluating this dog it's dragging legs you see no convincing movements on those legs you want to assess for pain we'll talk about it a little bit later but you do want to pinch along those toes preferably using hemostats and you want to make sure that they can feel their toes. They should turn and look at you, growl, bark, something. Um, and if they cannot feel their toes, then you know we're getting into true emergency status there. Um, any patient that can move their legs, can walk, you know, those sorts of things, you call and say, hey, this dog's ambulatory. There's no need to check its pain. It should have it. Um, ataxia and coordination is the next big one. So what are we seeing um, there? So in coordination three big types of incoordination. You have proprioceptive ataxia, meaning it's most likely coming from the spine, sometimes can come from the brain, but these patients are crisscrossing. They're not able to walk a straight line. You have vestibular ataxia, that's more of the balance dysfunction. So these guys can be really drunk looking, falling to one side, circling as they fall, head tilting to one side. The last one we can see is cerebellar ataxia. So the cerebellum sits in that back part of our brain and dampens all of our movement and tries to keep us in a nice, controlled, smooth movement kind of uh, position. So these patients can be really hypermetric, so super over-exaggerated, have head tremors, have intention tremors, you know, trying to go to the food bowl. The last couple of things that we can see is lameness. So is a dog not wanting to put weight on a limb and holding it up? Um, or is there just exercise intolerance or a true weakness? So sometimes you'll walk, watch dogs walk and they're doing just fine, fine, fine. And then they're getting more exercise and then they slowly start to slow down. And sometimes you'll see them kind of hunch over in their back legs. And when you see those things, you're more worried about, you know, things like myasthenia gravis, more of those peripheral nervous system types of, of diseases. All right, so next couple of things here is spinal reflexes. So you have flexors and myotactic reflexes. Um, when you're assessing these, you want to say whether you think they're normal, decreased, increased, or absent entirely, and that can help you pinpoint um, specific spinal cord lesions, and we'll go over a chart with those. So the big um, uh, areas where we have of our spinal cord where we're testing reflexes is the C6 to T2 region. So kind of in the region of the shoulder blades, that spinal cord section is responsible for the reflexes of the front limbs. The most um, reliable reflex that you can get there is the withdrawal. So pinching in between the webbing of their toes, you should see them flex their carpus, elbow, shoulder all the way up and they should um, be able to bring that leg back. Down the back, the T3L3 lesion localization, you want to test the cutaneous trunchi. Um, so you'll basically pinch along the wings of the ilium over their hips, and you should see a nice clear skin twitch all the way down, and you'll check both sides for that. 
L4S3 or L4S2, um, you'll be checking in the back legs. So again, the most reliable reflexes there are your patellar reflexes, um, specifically testing L4, L5, L6 nerve roots. Um, and then you also have your pelvic limb withdrawal. So again, pinching between those toes, they should flex their hock, their stifle, their hip, and bring that leg all the way back. And the last one is the perineal reflex. So um, taking like a Q-tip or a hemostat, uh, going by um, the external anus, and you should see that sphincter uh, contract. Sorry, guys. All right, last little part here is pain. So we want to assess, is there any pain along the spinal column for the patient? So when I do this with patients for the neck, I will try to find the atlas, so the wings of the atlas right behind the neck, and you'll palpate down the cervical spine along the transverse processes, because um, there's a lot of muscles up top and you can't really push down very well. So checking those for the sides is really helpful. When you get down to the shoulder blades, down to the hips, um, holding your hand underneath their chest or abdomen and putting your fingers on either side of the um, spinous processes and pushing down um, uh, gently if you know the patient's going to be uh, painful, but if signs are a little bit more vague, sometimes you have to be a little bit firmer to see if you can get signs of discomfort. Generally, the patients are going to turn and look at you, wince away from you, try to get away from you. Um, if it's super painful, you know, growling and showing teeth is, is sometimes what you can see. Um, you also want to make sure sometimes you throw in parts of the orthopedic exam, check those stifles, make sure the knees are comfortable, extend the hips out. Uh, sometimes you can have bad hip pain that can look neurologic. Um, lastly, for the spine, I do a tail jack, so taking my hand at the base of the tail, going all the way up, all the way down, left, right, make sure that they're comfortable there. Uh, same for the neck, should be able to bring their chin all the way down to their chest, look all the way up, and bring their muzzle to their side on either side. Um, and we kind of already touched on this, but if you have a patient that you think has no motor function, they're truly plegic, you should pinch on the toes and make sure that they can feel pain in their toes so um, that they have no susception essentially. And um, that is critical for a prognosis for some of these patients. All right, so talked about a whole lot of steps and a whole lot of nerves and, you know, why do we do all of those things? Well, the whole point of that neurological exam, like we talked about, is trying to pinpoint where in the nervous system are we seeing dysfunction? So um, we have multiple parts of our brain here. Um, so we have the prosencephalon, which is the forebrain. Um, there's two um, subcategories of that, the telencephalon and dilencephalon, um, but essentially make up uh, this region of our brain here. We have three distinct components of our brainstem, our mesencephalon, our metencephalon, where we kind of lump in the cerebellum or that back part of our brain. And then the last part is the myelencephalon or the medulla. Um, and that's where a majority of our cranial nerves will live. So uh, point, point of going through and doing all of these cranial nerve checks is to know where do those nerves go back. So you can have just the individual nerve itself. So as after it's left the brain, you know, that individual nerve can be affected by something. But if you're seeing uh, several cranial nerves be affected, you're going to want to start thinking, where do these lead back in the brain? And is there more of a diffuse brain problem that's now taking out the start of some of these cranial nerves? So we have... Um, um, cranial nerves one and two going back to the forebrain, three, four going to the mesencephalon, uh, cranial nerve five is the only one in our metencephalon, and then six through 12 go through the myelencephalon. So again, a vast majority of your cranial nerves there go back to that caudal part of our brainstem. And then there's no cranial nerves uh, that originate in the cerebellum, but the cerebellum has very distinctive signs. We'll show some videos of that here. Um, so can have some classic um, things that you'll see on your neuro exam that can help you pinpoint to that region of the brain. So some um, things that you're going to want to look for if you think you have dogs um, or cats or veterinary patients in general that are showing brain signs. So some of the things that you'll see with four brain signs, um, you'll see some postural reaction deficits, so some of those paw place deficits. Remember it will be on the other side of the lesion. You can see blindness because we know that occipital lobe um, processes vision from the opposite eye. Seizures are a big classic for forebrain lesion localization. So any dog that or cat that you have that has seizures, the only good thing about the seizure is you know it's coming from the forebrain. 
any kind of behavior changes, so dogs not doing their normal routines, uh, comes from forebrain. Uh, circling also can come from forebrain. Head turns, not necessarily tilts, but head turns can happen. And obviously any cranial nerve one through two deficits. Um, for the mesencephalon, you can get some specific um, postural um, deficits, and we'll show those at the end under special syndrome, so a decerebrate rigidity. You can see tetraparesis with these um, lesions, so all four limbs being weak, seeing in coordination in those limbs, uh, major changes in mentation. Remember, our brainstem is where we're going to start to see obtunded, stuporous, comatose patients, cranial nerves three through four there. And then metencephalon and myelencephalon, again, weakness, incoordination. Any patient where you're seeing those central vestibular signs, you're going to be leading back to your myelencephalon or your brainstem. Uh, but any cranial nerve 5 through 12 changes, again, worried about that back part of the brainstem. And then we talk about the cerebellum uh, separately. So some of the big things, um, I've always uh, had the cerebellum described to me by my mentors as being like, kind of a protective mother and kind of putting a break on everything that you're trying to do uh, to keep you safe. So when you take away those breaks, you're gonna see animals that are very spastic, that are very over-exaggerated or hypermetric. You'll see ataxia, sometimes nystagmus. They have a specific posture called decerebellate rigidity, and we'll get into that. Um, and you can also have some menace deficits that are a little more specific. Um, so we're going to go through some quick examples here so that we have enough time for Q&A at the end. This is a patient that has a right um, forebrain problem and he is unable to perceive his food on the left side of his face. But if I bring it over to the right side where his left side of his brain is normal, he um, suddenly sees the food. And, you know, it does look like he's maybe just being a little stoic, a little behavioral. I promise you this dog was very, very hungry and he could not eat his food because he could not perceive it unless we brought it to that side of his face. I believe he had had uh, suffered a stroke. Um, this is a great example of a cerebellar patient. Again, we've removed the brakes. This guy is very over exaggerated you know there's no need for him to be as high steppy as he is he's wildly um ataxic he's got this cerebellar ataxia just kind of falling and needs this kind of sling and support to kind of get around another quick example of a cerebellar patient so um, this guy has inflammation within that cerebellum or cerebellitis so you can see he is having these intention tremors head tremors um, can be confused for seizures but look how alert and appropriate this patient is he knows my students moving around the room and he knows that i'm in there videotaping him and he's, he's watching us as we do that so um, the quick spinal cord regions that we need to know, um, we have C1, C5, sorry guys, um, that is originating in our neck, C6 to T2, where those spinal reflexes are for our front legs, T3, L3 in the mid to lower back region, cutaneous trunk eyes, the big one that we test here, and then L4 to S3, um, where um, the withdrawal patellar and other spinal reflexes of the back limbs are. So this is a nice handy little chart of when you're testing your forelimbs here or your reflexes here um, or watching that gate, trying to distinguish where in the spinal cord um, are we seeing. So C1 to C5, we're not going to see specific reflex deficits. Sometimes you can see the uh, reflexes be a little over exaggerated, but they can be normal because it's, it's higher up. When we get to the C6, T2 um, lesions, we're going to start to see weakness downstream, paw placement deficits potentially in all four legs, and we're going to start to see those reflexes in those front legs be abnormal. T3, L3 regions, uh, lesions, you can um, start to see your cutaneous trunk eye not be normal. So you're pinching back here and you're not getting that skin twitch. You're going to have to start slowly moving up, pinching to see where is that uh, reflex strong again? And you're basically testing where along this track do we think a lesion is. Again, T3, L3 lesions, you're gonna start seeing some weakness and coordination, et cetera, in those back legs and probably paw placement deficits. Lastly, that L4, S3 lesion, um, you're gonna start to see your reflexes um, become affected in the back legs, front legs and things should be normal. And you'll start seeing some paw placement deficits in those back legs.
So a couple of quick examples here of what we would expect to see with spinal cord diseases in dogs. So C1, C5 myelopathies, this is a wobbler. So he had surgery um, to um, remove some compression along his neck. You can see this guy is very crisscrossy. He's weak. He's taken two doctors uh, to get down the hallway, um, but this guy did make a great recovery in the long run. He just needed some time. Next, C6 to T2 myelopathies. This has a very classic gait, so called a two-engine gait. So these guys can have lower motor neuron signs in their front legs where they're kind of weak and upper motor neuron signs in their back legs. So this little guy is going step, 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 step in those front legs, and he's got really slow moving back legs. So it looks like two engines are, are running at different speeds there, so they call that a two-engine gait. All right, we're going to move through these a little quick so we have time for Q&A. Um, next one here, T3, L3 myelopathies. So like we talked about, mid to lower back region, classic little Frenchie here who has had a disc herniation, um, was um, paralyzed before surgery. So you can see he's reluctant to move, but he can move those front legs. But you can see how draggy and knuckly he is in those back legs. And this little guy went on to make a good recovery too, running around now. And then lastly here, just a good example of an L4, S3. So again, front leg should be normal. This patient's reluctant to move forward, but can move forward, is able to support itself on its front legs. But you can see we're very flaccid in these back legs. There's no definitive movement in those legs. And when we are setting that patient down, you can see that sometimes those legs will knuckle over. So there's a lack of proprioception or awareness of where those feet are. Okay, guys. So um, we're gonna go through this really quickly. Peripheral nervous system is kind of its own beast, but there is a nice little chart here for you of what we will look for um, in a peripheral nervous system dog. Uh, best video or best, you know, best kind of teaching tools of video here. So this patient, super weak, not even trying to move those back legs, you know, barely moving those fronts. And as we get further along, starts to knuckle. So you could think that this patient is a neck patient. So, um, you know, has a C1, C5 that's causing all of these deficits um, downstream. But the key with our peripheral nervous system dogs is checking our reflexes. So checking this biceps uh, reflex here, triceps reflex here, we're not getting any kind of muscle jump. And the big tell all for the front legs, the withdrawal. So I'm pinching in between the toes here. You can tell the patient feels it, you know, trying to move away from me, but can't withdraw that limb. And then same for the um, back legs here, uh, no patellar reflex there. And if, if at first you don't succeed and you don't know if a patient's just not being cooperative, always double, double check your reflexes, which we did there. And then we checked gastroc reflexes here, did have a little bit of a gastroc there. Um, but again, the tell all, trying to do a withdrawal, pinching between the webs of our toes, trying really hard, patient definitely can feel that, but is not able to suck that leg back towards the body like they should. And so a patient that has reflex deficits, you would have to have two different spinal cord lesions, right, to kind of um, have reflex loss like that. So when you have those diffuse reflex losses, we think of peripheral nervous system. So I'm gonna run through these special syndromes real quick, but we can send out um, basically a little itinerary with all of this. But Horner syndrome is a classic sign um, that we see that looks very weird when you first see it. So you have um, meiosis or a, a constriction of our pupil here, um, ptosis, so drooping of that eye. Um, that eye can be retracted in ophthalmus, and you can also have third eyelid elevation. What we need to know is that there are multiple parts of the brain, spinal cord, and individual nerves that can be affected to cause Horner's. Um, most commonly, we see this with um, some patients with inner ear disease. Decerebrate rigidity. So this is a severe brain stem lesion, and they can be rigid in all four limbs. Um, these patients should be mentally inappropriate. Decerebellate rigidity. So it's, um, this kitty has had a stroke to the cerebellum. So we have relaxed back legs, extensor rigidity in our front legs, but this patient will have a normal mentation because the brainstem's not involved. 
Lastly, shift Sherrington posture. So anyone who has seen a lot of dogs with disc herniations, if they have a herniation within um, the thoracolumbar region, within specific um, segments between L1 and L5, these patients can develop rigidity in their front legs and be flaccid and potentially have loss of reflexes in the back legs because of how severe the lesion is. But it is not a prognostic indicator for these patients. And the last little bit here is a little bit about spinal shock. It's a little bit more of an abstract thing. Again, with a T3, L3 lesion, sometimes the, that lesion can be severe enough where we start to see loss of reflexes, even though that spinal cord segment, that L4, S3, is normal. And we term that spinal shock. And we do see that in humans um, as well as um, in animals. So know that that can happen with a true T3, L3 lesion. Um, last one, sorry, paradoxical vestibular disease. Know that sometimes the head tilt can be on the wrong side of where you're getting the paw placement deficits. But remember that the legs don't lie. So if you have a dog tilting head to the left, but has paw placement deficits on the right, the lesions on the right side, and this patient is having what's called paradoxical vestibular disease. The head tilt's going to the wrong side. And there's um, several different pathological reasons that that can happen. And here's a great example of that. Frenchie with a, or I'm sorry, Boston with a head tilt to the right, but has very over-exaggerated, very hypermetric left side of his body. And this patient did have paw placement deficits on the left side. So a great example of a paradoxical vestibular patient. All right, so I think I've um, pushed pretty far into our question time, so I apologize, but we'll give you guys um, several minutes to get all of that done. So a couple of quick things before we open up for Q&A. Um, uh, the first thing is um, you, anything that I don't get to know that we will email you. So we'll try to get to all of your questions, but I'll read some and go over them. Um, just another reminder that the one hour certificate for your CE will, uh, will be emailed to you. It will take about one hour from the end of this lecture. So don't panic if you don't see it automatically. We will get that to you. Um, a couple of other big announcements here. So for all of our veterinarians joining us in South East Florida, um, Seven is opening a third location in Jupiter. Um, so we will have um, uh, another neurologist joining our team and, and able to help you and your pets if they have a neurological uh, problem um, and facilitate you in Jupiter. Uh, so know that we'll have three locations there. The last one here is um, feel free to follow us on all the social media programs, Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, we do try to put out educational videos and even some short things as obviously as well as these webinars, um, but feel free to follow us there um, and um, you know follow all the content that we put out there. Um, so I hope that um, that was helpful for you guys. I'm gonna see if I can get to um, our questions here and try to answer some. So give me just a second to, um, get to some of these. Um, so a couple of the questions real quick. Will the lecture be available for review afterwards? Absolutely. Um, we will get that to you and I do have an outline of anyone that kind of wants that. We can email that to you. Um, and then uh, next question here um, from Dr. Ashby, um, fast phase is away from the lesion, correct? So in general vestibular um, uh, patients, so when you have horizontal nystagmus, the fast phase is away from the lesion. So remembering that acronym of we're falling asleep at the will and going toward the shoulder, that's the bad side. And we snap back and we correct, we're going away from the bad. Um, so that is correct. Um, if you have paradoxical vestibular disease, sometimes the eye movements don't add up. And like we talked about, remember that your paw placement deficits, the legs don't lie, they'll tell you which side of the lesion it is. All right, so next question here we have for brain tumors in the forebrain, could we expect a dull existence personality, slow walking, and droopy eyes? Um, definitely for sure you can have those lower levels of mentation change, so kind of those quiet alert responsive to mild to moderately obtunded patients. You can have that show up as a or, or be a side effect of a forebrain lesion for sure. A slow walking, definitely. Sometimes depending on what's going on, these patients can have pressure changes or inflammation that's adding to everything and they feel a bit uh, a bit dull. Uh, droopy eyes. Um, 
you know, generally speaking, if you're seeing drooping on one side of the face, you're going to be thinking more of cranial nerve seven. But if you do have a mass that's taking up space, sometimes it'll start pushing on parts of your brainstem and, and you can see some other things be um, um, at play there. Um, next question we have here. Um, can you review uh, decerebellate rigidity versus decerebrate uh, rigidity again if there is time. Absolutely. So decerebrate rigidity is um, that extension in all four legs. It is coming from a severe um, brainstem lesion. So those patients are not mentally appropriate. Sometimes they're very opisthotonic and will have their head up. These patients are not walking. They are laterally recumbent, mentally inappropriate. So that's the big way to kind of distinguish those. The decerebellate rigidity is when you've had um, uh, something like a lesion that has affected your cerebellum. So the cerebellum helps, um, again, put brakes on things. Um, so what you're going to see is you're going to see extensor rigidity of the front limbs, but flexed pelvic limbs. These patients generally can't walk and they're kind of all over the place. Um, but they should be mentally appropriate. So if you're looking at the, the animal, they should be able to um, you know, realize you know, where they are and be responsive to things going on. Um, going back to kind of those special syndromes and those postures, the other one is that shift Sherrington posture where the dogs can be um, extended and stiff in their front legs and flexed in their back legs. Um, a nice way to kind of say, you know, is this patient decerebellate or not? Get that patient up. So those T3, L3 dogs, if you get them up and they're in shift Sheraton, they will use their legs in a standing position. It's when you lay them down that they'll get into that rigidity. So that's a nice way to kind of distinguish those. So those are great questions. Um, get me just a second. Um, so next question here is, uh, what is the current thought on using steroids for conservative management for suspected spinal cord lesions? So that's a great question. And um, there is um, some research out there looking at, you know, NSAIDs versus steroids. So, you know, ultimately, it kind of depends on what owner's goals are. Um, the big thing with steroids and you know kind of their downfall is that they can cover up inflammatory disease so if you start a patient on higher doses of steroids and then they come for me for working up mri uh, spinal fluid tap sometimes it'll start controlling inflammation especially if it's immune mediated in nature and we won't be able to detect it as well depending on how long the patient's been on steroids so if you know you have a patient that wants to come to us you know give us a call and we can talk about whether or not adding in steroids um, the other thing is steroids tend to have uh, some bad side effects PUPD can predispose some patients that are neurologic to getting urinary tract infections depending on the dose that we're using so there's some kind of more like a comorbidity comortality um, problem with steroids as opposed to NSAIDs that are generally well tolerated with the exception of um, you know some GI upset that we can see um, I would say in my opinion there's not a consensus but just know what you're trying to do and why you're doing it when you're picking steroids versus NSAIDs. And if you ever have a question, feel free to call a local neurologist. We're generally really happy to help, you know, kind of medically manage a patient, especially if they're going to come to us for a workup. Um, so I think that is all the questions that I have listed for us right now. So thank you guys for those questions. Those are all um, super, super uh, great questions. Um, so if you guys think of any more, feel free to let us know and we can um, definitely uh, get those emailed out to you. I hope you guys um, had um, a learning experience with us today. Um, and if you have any other questions or want to make sure that you get on um, our email list for Synapse um, Conference, please let us know. Thanks, guys.